doesn't like petty texts, celebrity gossip, dating advice, spicy song lyrics, or just controversial opinions in general. Now imagine all that, but it's historical. In this podcast, we'll be reading some juicy historical letters, diaries, articles, and other piping hot tea. So get yourself something to drink and let's jump into textury. Hi guys, I'm Carolina and welcome to episode one of Textory. I am super excited because I have some really juicy material to share with you over the coming episodes. I was looking for a format that would be suitable for all historical eras and all sorts of media and I thought that historical text in all forms is something that is so fascinating and can tell us so much about the past, the present and the future. And it is also very compatible with the audio format, unlike, you know, showing some images. Text is just perfect for just listening. <laughs> so in this podcast, we'll be dissecting different types of historical texts in all shapes and forms, and we'll be reacting to them. I'll be giving some historical context where needed and also sometimes we will be featuring famous historical figures and sometimes not at all. So it's not another one of those um, podcasts where we are just learning history about famous people. It's, it's just going to be all over the place, which is good, <laughs> I think. So in today's episode, we will be diving into the world of 17th century London. I think it's such a fascinating era, especially in London. You know, it was a messy place. It was a messy and a fascinating place. They just didn't get a break. <laughs> they had great fire, they had the plague, there was restoration going on, witch trials. This is just the beginning of all the iconic events and figures that happened in that city at the time. And I just think it's so rich in different stories and, and dramas. <laughs> Because if we want to be more precise, we will be talking about crime in 17th century London today and particularly about petty theft. And not just petty theft. We're going to talk about theft that was actually petty. Because it turns out you could literally walk down the street in London and get your wig snatched. <laughs> A little bit of background, apart from all the things that I just said, let's let's talk about fashion, baby. What did people wear in 17th century London? We're focusing on, let's say, 1670s to 1690s today. If my opinion is of any matter, I think it's one of the prettiest uh, 17th century styles. Women would wear mantuas, which were those very structural gowns. And on top of their heads, they would wear fontans. Again, a very structured, stiff caps, um, decorated with lace. This is going to be important later on, so please remember that the stiff headpieces. This was also one of the first eras in women's fashion where women would wear heels because they adapted the heels from menswear. And um, this is around the time when heels were starting to be popular in women's fashion. It should also be mentioned that lace was used excessively and was really, really expensive because obviously it was a handcraft. It was a, a process that required a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of people working on it. It was a very expensive product. And the same applied to all sorts of fabrics and everything that was used to make clothing. It was just expensive. The brocades, the silks, all of that stuff. It was nothing compared to nowadays. Like nowadays, I cannot imagine someone stealing someone else's garment unless it's um, a designer piece maybe or something containing diamonds. I don't know, but just a regular dress. Like I can't imagine someone just snatching someone else's garment just because it looks nice. Like I don't think that happens at all. Uh, whereas back then... It was basically an asset, like expensive clothing or just any nice clothing, because all of the nice clothing was expensive. It was an asset that you definitely could steal. And a lot of theft at the time included not only, you know, gold and cutlery that was often made of silver and, and silverware, 
um, that was found around the house, but it also included stealing clothing, like stealing garments. So today we are going to look at um, Old Bailey court records. Old Bailey is a famous London-based court that is still working, or at least it's still in the same street. I don't know if the actual name is the same. It was also featured in numerous um films like V for Vendetta or uh, even Justice League. So it's basically it's very recognizable London court. What I like about British institutions is that they keep records, like ancient, really old records, and they still have them because they weren't burned and destroyed during the war, like a lot of Polish records had, for example. But uh, they keep them. And they digitized them, which honestly bless their hearts. There is a whole website, oldbaileyonline.org, which features those court records. And if you search through those court records, you get to search by crimes, by punishments, by, uh, you know, subjects, etc. So just a warning before we get into these. Obviously, it's 17th century and uh, the punishments are pretty bad. Uh, they're pretty drastic, especially considering the nature of the crime, which nowadays is just considered, you know, we definitely wouldn't want someone to get a death sentence <laughs> after stealing your clothes. But back then it was much more likely. So uh, let's jump into those. I'm actually excited to read them and uh, see what the tea was in, in 17th century. We're not going to go chronologically. But a lot of them are uh, either from 1670s, 1680s, or 1690s. That's sort of the period that we're focusing on. Because also, this is the period of da -da 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 -da, De Fontan, the head covering that was um, very popular. And apparently, it was also very popular to steal. Okay, the first one we're reading is Anne Butcher who was convicted for violent theft and robbery on the 27th of May, 1691. Uh, here is the record, the, the explanation of the whole thing. Anne Butcher was tried for that she, together with one Margaret Tyler, Christian Magdal, not yet taken, did make an assault upon one Mrs. Anne Glover in the poultry on the 21st of this instant May. She swore that as she was going along the street, the prisoner and two more women met her and assaulted her in a most violent and base manner, taking away a point lace headdress, value three pounds, one gold earring, value five shillings, a laced tippet, etc. The prisoner said she was in drink, which was no ways credited by the court, and she had no witness, but appeared to be a woman of a very wicked life. She was found guilty of felony. Several things here. First of all, wow. <laughs> I mean, imagine just going, just going down the street and three women attack you and they rip off your headdress. They rip off your earring, which I'm assuming probably also meant tearing her ear. Basically, just snatching your wig. <laughs> That's all there is to it. If she had a, any sort of hairpiece, some sort of attached curls or any sort of hairpiece, that would be snatched off with the headdress, I guess. So um, that sounds awful. But also, Anne Butcher was sentenced to death, which again, uh, a little bit of an overreaction um, <laughs> from the judges. But it also said that it was respited for pregnancy. So... Uh, as far as we're concerned, she may have eventually made it. But it's absolutely wild how desperate those women were. I'm assuming those were um, working class women. How desperate they were to snatch off all that stuff from a woman's head. And I, I'm also impressed because um, this all happened on the 21st of May 1691. And on the 27th of May the trial was already going through, like the trial was already ending. So uh, yes, they were a little bit rough <laughs> with the way they treated the prisoner, but they were very effective. Like a trial in less than a week, modern courts could never. Okay, Charles Stewart on the 26th of April, 1693. 
was arraigned for stealing a muslin headdress and other small linens from Anne Adams, to which he pleaded guilty. Um, this is not a lot of information that we get here, but just a disclaimer that men <laughs> would also steal those headdresses and uh, pieces of clothing, you know, we can guess that was definitely a valuable thing to possess. See, this is this is what is insane about all those court procedures, because, well, when I think a muslin headdress and small linens, I think probably something that's not a lot of value. But what happened to Charles Stewart was he was actually sent to military or naval duty, which is pretty big. You basically get your life thrown away because of this one crime you committed. I will not debate on whether or not the punishment is proportional to the crime. Maybe Anne Adams really liked that headdress, but also I feel like if someone that was higher class um, did the same, they obviously would not be treated the same way. 26th of April 1693, so just days after the previous case, Mary Middleton, a child aged about seven or eight years, was arraigned for stealing from Mr. Thomas Nichols, solicitor at law, two silver spoons, value 10 shillings, one a la mode scarf, value 14 shillings, a snuff box, value 5 shillings, a muslin laced headdress, value 6 shillings, to which she pleaded guilty. This one is a little bit shocking because this is a whole child. Like, this, this little girl was 7 or 8 years old. Either she was so poor that she had to steal those, or she was made by someone, perhaps her parents or guardians, to steal for the benefit of the family. Or she was just playing around. I know the stuff that I did when I was seven or eight years old. I would definitely um, be tried <laughs> at court in 17th century. And what's sad is that this little child was um, sentenced to branding, which is obviously insane. Um, for those of you who don't know, branding was basically using a red hot piece of metal to burn a symbol or a letter on your body. Something that you would have to carry with you like your entire life. So um, Mr. Thomas Nichols is basically on my blacklist for uh, snitching on her because if your first thought when you see a child stealing is taking her to court, um, you have some issues, sir. <laughs> and again, how was the child there? Was it a servant? Like, was she working there? Was it a child of a servant? What was she doing at Mr. Thomas Nichols' uh, place? Uh, something we would probably never know. In 1692, Mary Clever was tried for stealing one laced headdress, value five shillings, three yards of bone lace, value four shillings, a muslin cornet, value three shillings, and 20 shillings in money, on the 26th of November last. The prisoner was a washerwoman at the house of James Harper, from whom she took the things, which was plainly proved upon her, so she was found guilty of felony. This is really interesting because if she was a washerwoman, it makes total sense <laughs> that she would just uh, take some of the things that she was washing. But again, a lot of these things are headdresses. Uh, there is a lace headdress, which I'm assuming must have been a fontan because it's 1692, so it was very, very much in fashion. And there is yards of bone lace, which... I'm not sure what it means. I'm not um, well versed in lace history. Maybe some lace historians um, would be willing to explain that. A muslin cornet, so again, a headpiece. So all of the things that she was probably washing. And also, I think it's important to note that washing in 17th century was absolute hell. It took literal days. Like, even though you didn't actually wash the outerwear, or, um, you know, the actual dresses that you wore on top of all of the undergarments. Just washing the linens was 
awful. It took such a long time. Like every time I read a mention of um, washing in like 17th, 18th or 19th century, I'm like, God bless 21st century because I could never, I would walk around like a beggar all dirty because I would just refuse to do that. There, there ain't no way. So shout out to Mary Clever for being a washerwoman because it must have been so, so freaking difficult and so exhausting. On 6th December uh, 1693, Mary Vincent, there is a name that I don't know how to how to de- decipher, but I'm gonna call her L because it looks like double double letter L. But basically Mary Vincent, L. Crow and Elizabeth Edwards were all three indicted for robbing one Henry White of St. Mary Hill on the 29th of November last of a silver tankard, value nine pounds, one laced headdress, a pair of stockings, a silver coat of arms, value five pounds, a cup, value 15 shillings, and diverse other goods of value besides 15 shillings in money. Mr. White deposed that Vincent was his servant and had been so for above five weeks, and she had induced the other two to be concerned with her in the robbery. They were all taken at Billingsgate with some of the goods in their custody, and they confessed the fact, and that they had sold the plate and divided the money amongst them. They denied the fact at the trial except Vincent, who would have excused the other two, but that did not avail them. They were all three found guilty of felony. Um, let's unpack this. <laughs> First of all, shout out to Mary Vincent. Why are all the thieves named Mary? <laughs> like, I know it was a popular name, but like, Mary, what is up with you, girl? I find it really interesting that she was trying to take the blame on herself. Like, she didn't want to drag her friends into it, but unfortunately, they were all branded. So, um, could have been worse. Uh, could have been whipping but they were branded. Interestingly enough, on that very same day, George Green and William Guy were both tried for stealing from Robert Moore on the 16th of August last, a trunk containing in it one point lace headdress, value six pounds, one tippet, value 20 shillings, a locket, value 12 shillings, and several other goods. Mrs. Moore was coming from Epsom in a coach, and in Grace Church Street, the box was taken from behind the coachman, and two or three young fellows were hovering about the coach, one of which was one Joe Potter, not yet taken, but no person could change the prisoners with the felony. So they were acquitted. Okay, interestingly enough, there is a price given for the point laced headdress and the value is six pounds, which is quite a lot. Because if we look at the previous record um, with Mary Vincent on the, on the very same day there was a trial, a silver tankard was valued nine pounds. So a piece of silver was almost as expensive as a laced cap. I find it interesting how every single time they refer to it as point laced headdress. 11th July 1694. Mary Mooney and Elizabeth Doyley were tried for breaking the house of John Hedgecock about 11 o'clock in the morning on the second instant and took away two petticoats, value eight shillings, They confessed the fact when taken that they took away the things, but nothing was broken and Mooney was entrusted to dress Hedgecock's children. One petticoat was found upon Mooney's back and both were found in the room where they lodged. Yet they had the face to deny it at the trial. Nothing was found about Doily, so she was acquitted, but Mooney was found guilty and she was whipped. But uh, this one's really interesting because they were really sneaky about it. Like, (laughs) stealing a petticoat and then wearing it on yourself is such a smart way of committing theft because as long as a person you were stealing from was a prude, they would not dare to touch your clothes to check if you're wearing it. So, uh, slay Mary. Um, Too bad you got whipped. 10th October 1694. Mary Shepherd was indicted for stealing a Flanders headdress, value three pounds ten shillings, a pair of sleeves, 
10 shillings, the goods of John Adams. There was no one in the house when the goods were missed, but the prisoner, which was September the 23rd, she came occasionally to fetch a hood she had sent to Mrs. Adams to be washed. And whilst her back was turned, she took the goods. She was found guilty. Now, please explain to me why this particular one was considered worthy of death penalty because I am really confused right now. So basically, she stole what what everyone else was stealing. No, the, the value is not even bigger. So she sent her own hood to Mrs. Adams to be washed. And while she was like getting her hood, she took away the goods from Mrs. Adams. How is that any worse than what... I've seen before. I don't understand this. Uh, 10th of October, 1694. Catherine Stevens was tried for stealing a Flanders lace headdress, value four pounds, an apron, 10 shillings, a lace cravat, and diverse other goods of value from William Southern, who swore that the prisoner was his servant in April last and that she robbed him of the goods aforesaid, which she confessed to have sold in Duck Lane for five shillings where they were found. The prisoner in her defense at the trial alleged that she, being a poor country girl and not able to speak for herself, they laid this felony to her charge. Southern had his goods again, so she was only found guilty to the value of 10 whippings. This I'm confused about because, okay, the only difference here is that William Southern got his stuff back, but it's the same stuff. Like, the previous girl also stole a Flanders laced headdress, and um, it was a similar value, and yet the other one was killed while this one was just whipped. So I'm genuinely confused at the <laughs> at the punishment system. Uh, but also I love her because the prisoner in her defense said that she is a, a poor country girl. <laughs> oh, Catherine. I mean, it worked. So uh, you go, girl. 8th of July, 1696. George Rossiter of the parish of St. Gregory's was indicted for assaulting one Mary Stutter on the highway and taking from her a laced headdress, value 40 shillings, on the 12th of June last, the goods of Elizabeth Rock widow. It appeared that Mrs. Rock sent her maid to fetch the headdress from the washers, and there came two men and shoved her up, and another came behind her and took it out of the box and went away with it. There was another evidence that did hear him confess the fact, and thereupon the jury, taking it into consideration, found him guilty of felony only. How is George Rossiter, who clearly had a bunch of people that basically snatched this, this poor girl and took her stuff away, how is he only guilty of felony and how did he only receive a branding whereas this other girl was killed? I am genuinely still flabbergasted. So he was only branded, apparently, for straight up <laughs> assaulting a girl and uh, getting her stuff away and then just leaving. I'm just comparing the headdress prices here. This one was 40 shillings, but it only says a laced headdress and not a point laced headdress. 8th of July, 1696. Anne Bell of the parish of St. Andrews Holborn was indicted for feloniously stealing on the 3rd of June last a laced muslin apron, a headdress and a pair of muslin ruffles, the goods of Thomas Petchel, senior, and a pair of buckles with Bristol stones, the goods of Thomas Petchel, junior. It appeared that she was servant in the house and took opportunity to take the goods away and part of them were found in her custody. She had little to say for herself. <laughs> the jury found her guilty. <laughs> Why is it so funny? She was just like, yep, I did it. I don't know what to tell you. A pair of muslin ruffles. I wonder if that was like a ruff or uh, maybe like cuffs. That's interesting. 
9th of December, 1696, Mary Oliver of the parish of St. Brides was indicted for feloniously stealing a laced headdress, value four shillings, the goods of Jane Price Spinster, <laughs> oh, slay, on the 8th of May last. The prosecutor declared that she had been robbed of a great deal of linen, plate, and other goods and found the headdress upon her. She did deny the fact and said that it was given her by her husband. The jury acquitted her. I love how the only description of a woman was either her husband's occupation or just straight up spinster. But also, oh, I don't know anything about this headdress. Uh, my husband gave it to me. I don't know what it is. Um, iconic. Hester Metcalf of the parish of St. Bridget's was indicted for feloniously stealing a silver spoon the goods of Richard Lawson and a headdress, the goods of Jane Richardson, spinster, to which indictment she pleaded guilty. Hester was a female name, that's interesting. 1st of September, 1697. That doesn't seem like a lot of stealing, like just a silver spoon and a headdress. That sounds like she was really desperate and yet she was uh, sentenced to branding. Okay, this one's the very last. 1st of September, 1697. Anne Crosby of the parish of Stepney was indicted for feloniously stealing a silver spoon, dram cup, and a Flanders laced headdress, a silk scarf, with diverse other goods of William Roach on the 23rd of August last. The prosecutor said that as he was lying upon the bed, she came into the room and so into the closet where she took the goods. With that, he asked her what business she had there, and she said that she came to look for press masters, but mistrusting her, they found the goods upon her, and in her cap, next her head, they found the dram cup. The prisoner denied that she stole them, saying she saw them lie upon the ground and took them up. But it did not avail her. The jury found her guilty and uh, and she was branded. This is such a funny way of stealing because I can just imagine William Roach just straight up lying on his bed and like not giving a hoot. And his servant just walks into the room and looks into the closet and he can hear like uh, the juggling of the goods like straight up a cup and a silver spoon, like all of the clink clang. And he's like, wait a minute, what what are you doing in a closet? And she's like, uh, I'm looking for an iron. And he's like, well, iron doesn't make that sound though. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, why is your apron so full? And she's like, well, I'm, I'm, I just ate a lot. <laughs> and he's like, the silver spoon is literally showing. <laughs> uh, it just seems like, well, what could have been a hilarious moment, but clearly it was not because Anne Crosby ended up getting branded. So this is the case with uh, pretty much everything in history. Like, you find it funny until you think about it and then you're like, wait a minute, that's actually horrendous. And I'll be honest with you, it's difficult to not dig into past to the level where all the romantic visions that you had are overshadowed by the absolute cruelty of the society of the era. Sometimes when I'm reading stuff like this, I have to actively remind myself that it was a, a completely different society and the moralities were completely different and they based on something completely different than what they do nowadays. But it's still kind of shocking to see, you know, all of those punishments for something as simple as taking someone else's headdress. Um, and I imagine, like, if I lived in the 17th century and I was well off, it must have been pretty frustrating to have servants constantly trying to cheat you, because it is a, a motive that appears in a lot of 17th century uh, written work, is, like, servants just straight up trying to steal stuff from you and then pretending they didn't. So I imagine it must have been frustrating, but also, you created that society, my dude. If you're a 17th century wealthy man you also contributed to that, to the fact that servants found it necessary to steal from their masters. And um, I don't know why I got into all this deep monologue, because at the end of the day, 
These are just fun court records about people that lived how many years ago? I can't do math. Over 300 years ago. So I'm pretty sure they got their peace by now. And if they didn't, I'm, I'm sure they had a fair share of haunting um, whoever um, sentenced them to death <laughs> or whipping or branding. Anyway, this is it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed Text 3 and I'll see you guys again with a whole bunch of new juicy text to dissect. So uh, thank you for listening and uh, see you next time.